Thank you very much, Caroline. The um, Declan Kyle from Guy's Hospital in London. The, as a matter of serendipity, I, I want to just show you this cartoon, which I was sent uh, two weekends ago whilst I was actually preparing the talk uh, from a patient of mine. My friend, the year is 2011. I have a machine that can look through your skin and see your bones. I have a machine that can, uh, can keep you alive even if your brain and heart don't work. I even have a machine that can look at a drop of your spit and tell you who your parents are. But right now, I need to roughly gauge the approximate size of your prostate, so I'm just going to stick my finger in your butthole and wiggle it around a bit. <laughs> so, I think that's very relevant to prostate cancer diagnostics, and uh, it's, going to, uh, it's going to be particularly relevant for Claire Allen, who's following me and talking about the technology, but we can certainly put our house in order by getting our bit right, which is the tissue diagnosis. So prostate cancer diagnostics has been uh, described already as something that you know, we've got to get right. We want to diagnose uh, the real stuff that counts, and we don't want to hurt our patients while we do it. The challenges of early detection are the lack of specificity of PSA, the fact that there's no PSA cutoff, there's no symptoms of early disease, and imaging molecular and molecular characterization aren't there yet, and we hear this over and over again. However, the, uh, we've got a lot. I mean, we've got an awful lot of information, and uh, clinically uh, switched on experienced urologists can get it right uh, the vast majority of the time. The most important thing we can do, and we can do very easily, is uh, avoid the number of unnecessary biopsies uh, we do. So the, the, the obese 75-year-old diabetic with no teeth, a PSA of 9 and large BPH, does not need a biopsy. The challenges in biopsies, these are the chapter headings in the book. You know, what's the optimal number of cores? sextant versus extended, uh, where do we biopsy, which sites, lateral, peripheral zone, do we do systematic or targeted biopsies, uh, do we uh, repeat biopsy uh, if, the, if the PSA is raised, the suspicion is still there, and uh, uh, if we do that, how do we do it, the, uh, what's the optimal pathological processing, uh, what is insignificant disease, uh, what about overdiagnosis and overtreatment, uh, how, how can we identify the gold, uh, the gold standard? There's a, a verification bias in all these studies because we don't know how many people within each of the studies actually has cancer because by definition we're, we're, they're a sample. And then the, uh, the other question that uh, I'm going to gauge and answer today is uh, whether or not transperineal biopsy offers any advantages over a transrectal biopsy and how should you choose that? Transrectal biopsy has been unchanged in 25 years. It's done under local anesthetic. It's often done by junior staff with minimal supervision. Uh, it's principally now a laterally directed 12 core peripheral zone biopsy. Cancer detection rate of about 44%. Misdiagnosis, we've heard already, about 30%. And uh, saturation transrectal biopsy doesn't underdress the, the sampling error in that the anterior part of the prostate still hasn't been looked at. So repeating a transrectal biopsy is merely resampling the same area you didn't find cancer last time. The transperineal biopsy is done under general anesthetic. It's painless. Uh, there's no fecal contamination. Saturation biopsy is straightforward. It's merely an increased number of cores. Adequate sampling of the whole gland is easy, not difficult, not a challenge. There are people in this room who can sample the anterior prostate transrectally, but most can't. Uh, with transperineal biopsy, it is easy. Uh, it's labor intensive, however, it's expensive. There are concerns about overdiagnosis, uh, but then uh, in 2013, should we be concerned about overdiagnosis? Can't we just manage it? Uh, retention with higher core number, and it lends itself more easily to MRI guidance. And when you have a transrectal biopsy that shows no cancer, no means no. Now, the a trans, a, a transrectal biopsy is uh, in the longitudinal on the left and uh, on the right, the, um, uh, the transverse image. Uh, is have got a very good and easy way of sampling the uh, peripheral zone that we can feel rectally. But it is difficult to sample uh, the anterior zone, particularly in large prostates. And as I said already, you can see on this slide how it is very easy uh, to sample all areas of the prostate uh, when you're coming from uh, the area of skin between the scrotum and the anus and the perineum. And this is depicted again looking at the anterior core, sampling the mid gland and the posterior core. So we do the transperineal biopsies under general anesthetic. We do use antibiotic cover, particularly if they've had a transrectal biopsy previously. There's no bowel prep. Alpha blockers to those 
uh, uh, who are very symptomatic but not routinely, no catheter, six cases per list is practical, uh, uh, although tongue-in-cheek, uh, we all work with different people. The, uh, uh, we prepare our biopsies, these each cassette costs a penny each, but you can place, uh, you can place the cores uh, from lateral uh, to medial so you know where they came from rather than mixing them up in a bottle. Uh, you can ink them so you know which is apical and which is basal, and you get a lot more information from your biopsy. So each bang of the gun is delivering you a lot more information with which you can manage that patient. This is uh, my colleague Rick Popert. I'm just not going to give you a long video, just a short video, uh, just showing uh, an anterior core, the peripheral zone laterally. Betadine prepared skin, it's clean. That's a good, easy sample of the anterior prostate. I'm now going to uh, describe to you some of the data. Uh, the, uh, the British data, the PROTEC study, uh, which I think uh, um, everyone can be very proud of, and a sample of that uh, study uh, looked at a, a, a section of uh, men and their prostate biopsy morbidity. And this is really important. Uh, they gave questionnaires to the men at the time of biopsy at seven days and 35 days uh, following the biopsy. 44% complained of uh, pain, 7% that was a major problem. 18% had fever, 6% of whom was a major problem. Um, Hemojaculate, 93%. 30% almost said it was a major problem. At seven days, 20% of men reported that a repeat biopsy would be a major or moderate problem. It does strike me that it is exceedingly unfair to re-biopsy a man who's had one transrectal biopsy uh, with another. The hospital admission rate was 1.3%, and 10% had primary care consultation for problems. Prostate cancer was found in 35%. Uh, from America, from a sample of the SEER uh, Medicare database, the admission rate to hospital following a transrectal biopsy is 7%, uh, half of which are due to sepsis. And from the European screening study, uh, from a, a section uh, uh, from Rotterdam, uh, the, the risk of fever was 4% and hospital admission almost 1%. The risk factors were diabetes and large prostates. And the frequency of admission increased year on year, which is thought to be due to increased uh, antibiotic resistance. Uh, although, again, it is surprising that we have all these uh, fevers and we all experience these cases of sepsis and men are admitted to ITU, but it's amazing in the European screening studies there were no deaths from uh, prostate biopsy. Antibiotic resistance, I'm not going to uh, elaborate too much in this talk, but uh, you know, extended spectrum beta lactamase, um, uh, E. coli, uh, other fluoroquinolone resistant uh, uh, bacteria are a real problem. And within our careers, I'm 45, but before I retire, I'm going to have some very challenging times of men with infections for which I've got no antibiotics. And uh, our, our risk of death in our practice from infection is going to become very much higher. And the, we have to prepare ourselves uh, for the inevitable and find ways to avoid that. There are three randomized controlled trials looking at uh, transperineal biopsy uh, versus trans uh, transrectal biopsy. Uh, however, they don't help us with this argument because uh, they're, not, uh, uh, they're not looking at what we're looking at today. They weren't using a template, they're using a low number of cores, um, and that explains why they didn't find any difference. There are four good large case control studies, um, and they found no difference either. But again, they weren't using a template. So they, I'm going to tell you a little story about Daisy the cow. And so where you've got no good evidence, you have to, uh, you have to come up with an opinion. So let's start off this now. From what I've told you so far, can I have a show of hands? Who in this, who in this room would have a transrectal biopsy over a transperineal biopsy? Okay, looks like we don't need Daisy the cow. But Daisy the cow, <laughs> Daisy, Daisy the cow, but you admit, it, you admit it, you offer it to your patients. Daisy the cow uh, was the prize uh, in 1906 at a fat stock and poultry um, uh, exhibition, and uh, in order to win her, you had to, uh, you had to guess what her weight was. And 800 people guessed what her weight was. There were a very small number of ex uh, experts, but most people were just local town folk. And not one person gained the, uh, guessed the correct weight of Daisy. Uh, and she was, in fact, 1,198 pounds. Uh, but the average of all the answers was 1,197 pounds. And this is called the power of the crowd. And so I think the power of the crowd today uh, has said that you shouldn't be offering your patients transrectal biopsy since none of you would take one yourself. However, I will carry on the talk because I do have, a <laughs> uh, I, I do have some more to show you. The, um, now, I'm just going to highlight uh, some studies which I think there are, there, there are things that we can learn. You know, the, uh, 
if you do transpair and eel biopsies, you get better correlation with radical prostatectomy specimens. Uh, you get better characterization of apical and anterior disease. You get virtually no sepsis, one out of 747 cases in the Moran study. Uh, sepsis uh, wasn't uh, described in 371s in the Demura study. And the, uh, if, you have a, if you had a previous biopsy transrectally and you repeat it transperineally, you will find cancer. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean you're overdiagnosing cancer because these patients aren't the same as the screen population. These are patients whom you suspect to have cancer, but you've missed, and that's why they're having a further biopsy. So these can be significant cancers. If you look at these, the, uh, we learn that, uh, again, there's no sepsis. There is a risk of overdiagnosis, but I've said in, in 2013 we can, we can manage overdiagnosis with surveillance. Uh, big glands uh, at a higher risk with high numbers of biopsies of retention. And probably the best study looking at uh, adverse effects comes from the Sydney group, Phil Stricker's group, uh, which was published recently in the BJI, and they identified a, a great deal of bother with, with hematuria, a small risk of retention and fever, but septicemia was very low uh, at one in, it's fallen off, one in 0.2%. Uh, uh, the, um, the, the Guildford group, um, Steve Lang is here today, have, have published on looking at patients with active surveillance, and they found that if you, if you transperineally biopsy a patient on active surveillance, 30% of the time, they'll actually have more disease. And 7% of men, they'll actually have primary pattern four. And we found the very same thing at guys, that if you biopsy 100 men with Gleason 3 plus 3 disease transperineally, uh, a third of them will, in fact, have Gleason 3 plus 4 or more. And it, it's amazing how similar the figures are, 8% of primary pattern 4 plus 3, uh, 4 plus 4, or 4 plus 5. And this, this holds true also uh, for a group of three, some three, three plus four men who went on to act, uh, who, who wanted active surveillance, and they were found to have 30% uh, variation on their histology as well. The, uh, the, um, our, our case series, looking at all our transperineal biopsies in primary and secondary, uh, has also shown it to be safe, a significant diagnostic rate, and a very high rate of anterior only disease. The concern about transperineal biopsy amongst uh, radical prostatectomists is that it would make a radical prostatectomy harder. Now, this is a single surgeon data, but uh, we've matched 88 patients who had a radical prostatectomy after a transperineal biopsy uh, versus uh, a, a group of patients who had a transperineal biopsy, or, um, a, a radical prostatectomy after a transrectal biopsy. And in fact, uh, the outcome uh, was unchanged. Likewise, there's a big concern about erectile dysfunction and spearing the perineum as we do. And indeed, uh, anecdotally, one does notice a reduction in erectile function tempor temporarily, uh, but erectile function does return to baseline by six months. That's that group. The, uh, however, when we look at our group of men who have a, uh, a transperineal uh, biopsy done for a second time as part of an active surveillance program, uh, there is a higher risk of erectile function that doesn't go away. But if the active surveillance program can offer a 90% potency rate uh, to a 65-year-old man, uh, as opposed to far lesser uh, potency rates uh, with radical prostatectomy, that's not a bad thing. The big problem of uh, transperineal biopsy in the NHS today is that it's coded the same as a transrectal biopsy, and so we simply can't afford it. So how to decide? The transperineal biopsy uh, wins on diagnosis, infection, for active surveillance programs, and acceptability. However, it's very difficult to provide a service for this in this day and age, and it's expensive. At guys, you don't have a transrectal biopsy a second time. If there's further diagnostics uncertainty, you'll have a transperineal biopsy. Patients have recurrent urinary tract infections will have a primary, as will patients. Patients have recently had antibiotics because they've been shown to have higher risks of uh, ESBL E. coli. Recent foreign travel for the same reason. Uh, infection risks such as diabetics, large prostates, and patients who are obstructed. And there's another clause if you like the patient. This is another example about the power of the crowd that I'm just too, uh, I, I can't resist telling you again, it's the same as Daisy, but uh, Google uh, were explaining how their data is so good, and this is a, a jar of beans, and there's about, uh, there's a couple of hundred people in this room, just 160 people were asked how many beans were in this jar, and there were, there were, there were some very unexpert individuals that chose 400 or, or 50,000, uh, when the correct answer was 4,510. 
but the average of all those crazy answers came to 4,115, uh, 4, just five out. So the power of the crowd is good, and the power of the crowd this morning, I think, has said that transperineal biopsy uh, is a better way to look at the prostate.